I really appreciate you coming in today. As you can see, here's Boston. Here's our headquarters. I've got some concerns about the health of the organization. Is there anything you can kind of take a look and help us with? Welcome to the Amy Lodge here in Pittsfield, Vermont. Joe's Amy Lodge. Now, Joe is not here today, but Joe would want me to welcome as well to the lodge, uh, to my left, Sephra. Thanks. Hi, Joe. Uh, we've got Dr. Del Grimsmo. Hi, Joe. And we have Colonel Nye, retired uh, Colonel Nye. Yeah, where, where is he? Where's Joe? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know, but you know where I do well, know. I was told Mary I was classified. I thought you might it's, know. It's freezing in this barn again, as normal, and so where's <laughs> Joe? My understanding is Joe is in warm and uh, tropical Singapore today. Oh, very nice. Well, yeah. I guess but that's wait, why he can't be here. But the great thing is that allowed us to have you go and do a fantastic interview with uh, Jeffrey Zeisel. Jeff Zeisel. Fascinating guy. Fascinating guy. Uh, clinical um, social worker who meets people on the worst day of their life, as he puts it and kind of walks them through recovery. And he's got some really great tips for the rest of us. So I think we'll go and watch his video and then we'll come back and talk about it. <laughs> Welcome Spartans. We're here in the home of uh, Spartan headquarters in Boston. I'm with Jeff Zizel, a uh, clinical um, social worker who had works primarily here in Boston and has had a long history, uh, 30 plus years or so, yes, of working in the field. So um, anyway, for those out there in, in the audience, give us a little bit of background about yourself and tell us what a clinical um, social worker does and kind of what you've seen. My personal area of expertise is really dealing with people who are in traumatic situations. I do a lot of work with law, the law enforcement community, returning veterans. I also deal with uh, people with, interestingly enough, uh, drug addiction problems and mental health disorders, and I do consulting in companies, we call employee assistance programs. So I go and sort of take what I like to think of a macro approach. I go to companies, I stand in front of people, and I educate them about how to enjoy the journey of life, how to take care of themselves, how to reduce their stress, how to get along with others, et cetera. So we do a lot of things, wear a lot of hats. Uh, so you really are in there during the kind of crisis response mode, really, P or people people or organizations in crisis, Correct. and you help them. Part of my job is I meet people on the worst day of their lives. So someone will be working in a bank and it gets robbed, it's a violent bank robbery, right. a violent takeover. I get a call from someone representing the bank and they said, we have these 15 tellers, they're totally incapacitated, we closed the bank, the FBI just has left, can you please come in and tell us what we should do and help us? I show up. Historically, it's an interesting example because historically bank managers would often say, okay, we've just been robbed, we're closing the branch, go yes. home, take the day off. And take a couple days off, take as much time off as you need. And what we discover, we found that's the worst advice. And if you think about when people are in crisis, what do they need? They need support from others, they need to be with their friends, and they need people who actually understand what has happened. What, what they're going through. So, so I, so a typical day for me is, uh, you know, I can see some patients with a variety of problems, and it may be a mental health issue, a marital dysfunction, uh, you know, addiction problem. And then my phone will ring and they'll say, hey Jeff, uh, a plane just, a local plane, a small plane just crashed at the, at the airport and the people, the first responders are really uh, in rough shape. A kid got killed in the plane. Mm. And you know, the law enforcement community is a, is a pretty hardy group and most of them are remarkably psychologically fit. However, when kids die or get really badly hurt, that's, uh, you know, that, that sort of ruins it for everyone. So I usually go in and I try to meet with these guys and help them negotiate how to manage this problem. Well, but you say that the police are kind of a hardy bunch, and they yeah. aren't, but they're, they're somewhat screened ahead of time for that, right? And then they Correct. receive training on top of that to help, to help build that resiliency as well. So, um, so for those people, when you come into a situation like that and, and you say, okay, these five guys are going to need help, can you kind of already tell, do, you, do a quick assessment, can you tell who's going to need more help based... Uh, it, it, what are the, the, the individual skills those five people may have, mm -hmm. their backgrounds? Can you say, okay, that guy, that guy works out every day, or that guy goes to church every right. day, or whatever? Can you? One of the things we know about human beings is that we're all different. I mean, we have some universals, but we all have different constitutions. We react differently, genetic, culture, family background, mm -hmm. upbringing, et cetera, social class, and so on. But we never really know how someone's going to 
react under combat until you're under combat. Mm -hmm. Now, there are predictors. So what are the predictors? The predictors are people who've gone through difficult times in the past and managed to do okay. What we say in my line of work is the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Okay. So if you look at someone who participates in a Spartan event, how do you know who's going to do well? Well, how'd they do in the last one? The right. person who did really well has a good likelihood of doing well. The person right. who bonked or you know did not finish, is it possible that may occur? It's possible. We don't know because every event has a different circumstance. When you get you know a knee injury, you're out. You know that's understood. Knee injuries are hard to prevent. Mental injuries, you can actually build some strategies to, to prevent that from occurring. So people you know, are given a skill set to, to tell. So one of the things we know when we walk into a traumatic circumstance, 80% of, of communication is often nonverbal. So I could look at a group of men or women and say, oh, that person looks like they're in rough shape. Maybe they're having trouble. Yeah. We don't always know because some people also they, do withdrawn, withdrawn, or they, they and, and just the, their body are, language. So someone yeah, who's yeah. open and has open posture, yeah. you're not doing they're doing better. Someone who's sort of very closed and sort of leaning over and looks unhappy, they probably are. So well, that's me a lot of times. So <laughs> <laughs> people misjudge that a little bit, but anyway. Well, we all have our moments. Yeah. But, but it's interesting because there are characteristics that people have that we oh, know sorry. will allow them to survive. So, and. Part of my job is when I leave an event, I try to leave people with some skills and tools so when they forget all the things I've said, they have a couple things they can rely on. And, and interesting enough, human memory is really such that we retain about 11% of things that we get exposed to. So, you know, I can say 100% of things and, you, and people may only retain 11 so we need to give them like the bullet points. So what are the okay. bullet points? You're having a bad day, remember, A, A, A. Action alleviates anxiety. Sitting and brooding about all your problems doesn't help. Get up and do which, something. I always say 80% is showing up. Same, right. same thing, I right? say the same thing also. Get, get up and, and you know, you're gonna right. fail, you're gonna fail, but right. go, go, go that, find out. Right, exactly. If you show up, you, find, you might yes. find out you're gonna do better it's than everybody true. else, right? And, and I always say, before you show up, make your bed. So yeah. we know that people who make their bed had better days. Are you familiar with Admiral McRaven? Yes, Navy I, SEAL. Yeah, I worked for Admiral McRaven for a number of years That's anyway, and, and, and I, I have that speech, you know, obviously, <laughs> have it, you know, one, just a phenomenal, phenomenal leader. You right. know, obviously, Fantastic. there's a reason he was a four-star Navy Admiral, Navy SEAL Admiral. I mean, he is, of, of all the people I've ever met, kind of the, the, one of the standard bearers out there. What that research says is you make your bed, even if you're having a bad day, you come home, and what happens? You have a nicely made bed. Right. And it allows you to transition. Like, well, today was a really challenging day. Today is terrible. Tomorrow will be a better day. So one of the things we remind people is that traumatic experiences don't have to last with you in the same ferocity forever. You can, it can be a painful experience. It can be a terrible experience. And I see people whose kids have died of drug overdoses or accidents or have suicided. And when we talk about grief and how you cope with that, you know, there's stages of it. And, and historically, we used to say the last stage was acceptance. And I actually don't always follow acceptance. I think it's not acceptance. I think it's coping. It's coping with the new information. So you don't want to accept the death of your child, but you may have to find a way to cope. And that's really about being resilient. You know, it's not always a good situation, but you're going to survive it and make it manageable. So, so it's interesting. There was a study done, uh, Vietnam War POWs. And interestingly enough, Vietnam War POWs came back, and in spite of what the media portrays, they were actually pretty, pretty, pretty gr well held right. group. They, they, they survived. They were successful. They ran businesses. They were, you know, they're in Congress. They're in Congress, they're exactly. Senate. That's yeah, right. And we know Senate, one, so, yeah. ran for president. Right. So, uh, so they look at, they looked at how they coped in captivity, and what they discovered was that there was a group of men who developed traits of resiliency. And it's based upon some research. Uh, Dennis Charney, dean of uh, Mount Sinai Medical School, wrote a book about it. And they actually talked about how they develop qualities of resiliency. And there are, and some are, some folks are born this way, but the great news is you can actually acquire these, these qualities of resiliency. So when I go to traumatic events, or if, if I'm running the Boston Marathon, I remind myself of these traits because we all have bad moments and, and we go to the dark side once in a while and we have to self-talk ourselves out of it or have someone else talk ourselves out of it. So what are those qualities? Optimism. 
Now, interestingly enough, there are people who are just born optimistic. We all know people like that. They, it's in their genetic and it's in their DNA, and we have people like that. And then there are people who aren't, and we know who those folks are. Let's say, good day, Colonel. What's so good about it? Yeah. So uh, I'll fi when I let you, when I find out, I'll let you know. So yeah, people are optimistic. Then you, uh, and that's one of the great qualities. But also sense of humor, sense of purpose, altruism, moral compass, mm -hmm. spirituality, and faith. The social supports probably one of the most important things because without people, we're nobody. And we really need those. A sense of belonging. You've got to be in a group belonging. somewhere. And, and friendships and uh, helping people, you know, talk and, and finding out how we're managing things. And role modeling. So role modeling is an interesting thing because if I'm a role model for someone, people can look up to me. And I try to remind myself that I want to behave a certain way. But there are other people who I look up to and I say, well, I want to be like that right, guy. Right. I want to be like the colonel. Right. So, uh, but, but when you're on the top, you know, it does. It, it's those guys below you, and I don't mean to make it sound like, but you know, it's but, like, but that's true. But but if you're in charge of a group, you have to then. Our boss, Joe DeSanto, walks the walk. You know, right? Joe De, Joe talks about all this stuff. I've been with him. I mean, he's up at five every morning doing 300 burpees. He's running around the world. He's doing. He he does it. You right. know, and and those days maybe when he doesn't, it's the it's the the drive or the energy from everybody else expecting right. me to do it that continues to make you want to do it, right? That's exactly right. So we're going to continue this discussion, but we're going to take a quick uh, break, talk off camera a little bit. Marianne's going to give us some direction, and then we're going to come back and kind of talk about how to take, you've already done it, some of these rules and just extrapolate them out uh, to the broader audience. Perfect. I hope you're not sitting still while you listen. If you are, you better get a burpee break in. All right, welcome back. We're back here with Jeff Zizel in Boston headquarters. And we kind of uh, flipped the script here a little bit and we talked about some of the principles, everything. But I want to ask you uh, some examples from your own life and how you applied some of those principles mm -hmm. and how you were able to either, um, you know, affect your life or other people's lives. That, that's interesting because, you know, usually people end up in a certain place in their life for reasons. Sometimes they're good reasons and sometimes they're not so good reasons. So I grew up in New York City. I have an identical twin brother, Paul, who's oh, a nice. forensic psychologist. So he and I supported each other a lot. I have an older sister, lives in New York now. And it's interesting, when we were in high school, our mother was very ill and was diagnosed with cancer. And around the same time, our father was also an active alcoholic. So you grow up in this family dynamic mm -hmm. where every day you're walking in, you're not quite sure what's going to happen. You don't know if your father's going to be impaired, you know, drinking all day, and you don't know how sick your mother's going to be. So even in there, well, your mother was just stricken with an illness, so I, but I mean, even your father would have had to have taught you yeah. something, either either on the positive or the negative. I want to be like that, or I don't want right, to be like exactly. that, right? You have to... Yeah, and interesting enough, they, in spite of that, they were great people, and I love them, and, right. and it's funny, I was talking to my sister, and I said, you know, let's, let's look back on our family. Do you think you had a happy childhood? And we all agree, we had a fantastic yeah, childhood. Yeah. So, and why was that? Because you don't always focus on the bad. You focus on the, on the positive. Right. So when you're, what's a good lesson in life? Don't focus on the bad. Don't look at it as a terrible thing. Look at it as a challenge. Look at it as a, something to overcome. Look at it as something to beat, to defeat. To, and then you do that, what happens? You automatically feel better. Your self-esteem improves. And all those brain chemicals are flying through your neurons. Dopamine, endorphins, serotonin because you accomplished something that was so challenging. Joe, Joe DeSena talks about this concept of future memory. And it is once you have done something, it is easier to do it again because not only do you say, not only is it a confidence thing, like I've done it, I can do it again, but your brain actually releases, and again, you're talking about the endorphins and everything, but like you feel good. When you cross the finish line of an event, you, you feel good, right? And then so when you say, oh, I'm gonna start training for the next one, maybe you're not as good, but you know, you start to think about that finish line again, and that positive feeling starts to affect you again. So it just keeps cycling. So the more you win, the more you're going to win, right? right? So success breeds success, failure breeds failure, right? So it's once you get, and we talked earlier about the 80%, once you start pedaling that bike and you're going forward, it's easier just to keep going right. forward, right? You know, you grow up in a certain type of family, you learn these qualities, but then you have choices because you know, we're human beings, we have a consciousness, we have a mind, we have you know all sorts of influences and we can choose how we want to be. And some people sometimes take the easy way. And I always say, in life, the things that give you meaning are always hard. Taking the trash out is not something that gives you meaning, and it's not all that hard. But 
doing a spine race is a hard thing. Running the Boston Marathon is a hard thing. Being a U.S. Marine is a hard thing. And those things, not only give you meaning, but they give you confidence. And the more you do things that build your sense of self up, it, you continue to do that. And then, and the, the challenge is to actually maintain it, because now there's expectations, both external and right. internal. People expect you to do well, and people, and you expect yourself to, to do well. So interesting enough, they look at Olympic athletes. The gold medal winner, the silver medal winner, the bronze medal winner. The research was done. Who is the happiest person out of those three uh, 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 medal winners? You know what? I, I, I'm going to take a stab at this because I, 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 I'm going to say the bronze medal winner. And you are correct. And I don't know the study, but yeah. I, you tell me why and I'll tell you why I think so. Okay, so the, the gold medal winner, typically the people who win gold... We're expected to. We're expected to. The civil, silver medal winner... He's disappointed. Why? Because, because he was he, that close to win gold. He, he lost. The bronze medal winner is yeah. just happy to be in the game. Right. You know, he was so close to not meddling, he's happy to be in the game. Yep. Well, I tell you, from my own personal experience watching my children and then watching, we were at the wrestling tournaments yesterday. Often, uh, when you reach that level, especially at the Olympics or something, that's probably your last match as well, right? There's very few returning right. guys. So you, you walk off the mat as a, as, as a silver medalist, as a loser. Now, you're the second best guy in the world, but you just lost. The third place guy has walked off that mat as a winner, and everybody's going crazy because he's just won his last match. So, so it's interesting because we were talking off camera before about what, you know, people's personal adversities and stories and so on. So, you know, I grew up in this family, and then uh, a number of years ago, I think five or six years ago, my, my a primary care physician used to say to me, you're my healthiest patient. So I said, really, why is that? He said, oh, the you know, index these are great, and your BMI, your cardiac fitness is high, et cetera. So I said, oh, that's good to know. Then one day he says, hey, I just got your PSA, and you need to, spe your, your pro prostate, you know, blood work, it's elevated, we want you to get a test. So, so sure enough, I get the test, and uh, what I discovered, I discovered I had prostate cancer. Okay. So I speak to my doctor, it's interesting, I go for the biopsy, and he says to me, uh, it's a Monday. I'll, I'll call you Thursday. Sounds good, Doc. I'll, I'll speak to you Thursday. Tuesday, my phone rings. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come uh, in right now. We'd we, uh, like to have a little meeting with you. I said, oh, interesting. You tell me you're going to call me Thursday. I said, well, I'm kind of busy Tuesday, and I'm not coming in today, so obviously I must have a bad result. Well, I'd rather talk to you in person. Hey, I'm a big boy. You can tell me. What is it? Well, you're right. You have prostate cancer. Okay, what do we do from here? You need an oncologist, and you need to get it taken care of. So, uh, so at the same time, my identical twin brother, same DNA, he's over in Afghanistan as a uh, psychologist for the de Defense Department and the State oh. Department. He spent 38 months there. So I sent him an email. You have a long time. So uh, yeah, talk about PTSD. Yeah, that's a long time. But fortunately, he was able. He was with a. We were talking earlier about camaraderie. So you know, how do you get through adversity? With your friends, right. you know, and the, and the, maybe they're your new friends, but you're, oh, yeah, you're you bond friends. quickly. You bond very quickly. So uh, so I sent him a quick email. Hey, I just went to the doctor. I got good, and the doctor said I have good news and bad news for you, Jeff. Really, what's the good news? The good news is, you see that nice looking nurse? I have a date with her tonight. Excellent. <laughs> what's the bad news? Oh, the bad news is you have prostate cancer. Uh -huh. All right. So uh, so I of course go home and I tell my wife, and she thinks I'm going to die. And she's crying and totally losing it. And she says, uh, we have three sons. Why don't we tell the kids? Maybe we shouldn't tell them. I said, nope, we tell them everything. I said, the best thing in life is to be, be impeccable with your word and be impeccable with your truth. Be honest. Put it out there because whatever will happen will happen. And by the way, we're going to be fine. We will be fine. So optimism is not burying your head in the sand because being fine means whatever happens to me, you will be fine. And I checked my life insurance, mm -hmm. so they were going to be fine. Yeah. But be also... Well, you've got to be practical as well. You, right, that, that's I exactly mean, right. Yeah. You have to be practical. So you know, being optimistic is important, but you don't want to be naive. Uh, and how I'm how fine. are we to do today? Yeah, right? I'm fantastic, right, 100%. Well, so, uh, well, great. So, so thank you. So, uh, but it's interesting. So someone once said to me, boy, that event... So my doctor says, you know, if you don't get this treated, you're going to be dead in two years. I said, all right, well, I plan on getting it treated. So... A lot of my friends said, boy, that event must have changed your life. That's a, like a life threat. Anything. I said, absolutely then, not. No, no, right. I said, because I was that way before. Right. Because I'm one of those guys who like looks at life and say, hey, this is a gift, and I'm going to enjoy the heck out of it, and I'm going to be the best I can be, and 
with all the failures. And by the way, it's good to have failure because well, it means you try. All right, and, you're, and again, your frame of reference is that is life. Right. And exactly. so life every day is going to put something right. in front of you, right? I mean, whether it's you or what something happens to one of your children or you you not, you know lose a job exactly. or, or you end up going to help other guys who've seen something horrific. So every day is the challenge. That's so right. So say life-changing event, well, maybe, but, but if you're already accepting challenges that's and already kind of just blasting through them. That's right, it is a challenge. And we say life is unfair. You know, that's a truism. Life is unfair, but it can still be really good. So, you know, and our goal is to not only be good, to have a great life. And that doesn't mean every day is good because we know it's fluid. It's up and down. So when, when, you're, when you have your Spartan Warriors training and they're having a bad training, just remember that, you know, the Shackleton crew face amazing yeah, adversity. Far greater. And if they could do that, we could do whatever we need to do. So I'm a marathon runner. I'll be running the tw my 20th marathon a month from today, April 18th. I'm yeah. all banged up. I'm done. My body's gone. The mind's still there. What are the takeaways here? What are the, what are the rules and the tools that help people survive? We talked earlier about AAA, action alleviates anxiety. And I say, leave your life by the four Fs. What are the four Fs? Always have your friends, your family, fitness, and faith. And it could be in any order. But those things really allow us to get through. And what's faith? Faith is not religion. It's spirituality. It's looking at a beautiful sunset. It's believing that things can improve. And we know that when people are in a bad place, what gets them through it? Having faith, we're gonna get through this. Yeah. We will be okay. Yeah. You, know, you have one more wall to climb and you got nothing left in your tank, but somehow you get over it. 2015, Boston Marathon, bomb goes off. I'm running in with my 18 year old son, Austin. It's his first marathon. So uh, marathon day, I'm not running, I'm injured, but I said, I'll meet you at Heartbreak Hill. I'll run in with you. We run in. We get separated at Kenmore. He's in front of me somewhere. Bomb goes off. We're right before the finish line, right before you dip on Mass Ave and make that ride in Hereford and the left on Boylston. And a Boston cop says, hey, you gotta stop, the bomb went off. And I'm in shock. What, the bomb went off? Right. How, how's yeah. that possible? Yeah. And I hear the words, but I can't, I can't process comprehend it, it. I can't yeah. process it. So, and what's my first thought? Oh my God, my son is in front of me. Right. And then someone tells me, oh, it's really bad. People are dead. Hundreds of people are injured. There's body parts everywhere. There's legs severed. There's blood and, and, and flesh. It's really horrific. And I'm thinking, oh my God, my son right. is in front of me. So those are those moments in life that you never forget. And then you think, you know, how are you gonna manage this? So we talked earlier, you never know how you're gonna manage things until you're, you know, the shots are being fired at right. you. Even though you can be properly trained, you never quite know. That was, my, that was my moment. So I say to myself, I'm about to lose, and I say, wait a second. The first thing I say to myself is, God wouldn't do this to me. He wouldn't kill my son and take my son away from me. At least I'm hoping. And I say to myself, and if that's not the case, I'll deal with it when I find out. But yeah. why am I going to lose my cool before, before I know, you know the information? Right. And I also know with traumatic events and terrible tragedies, 90% right. of the intel, 90% of the information you get will be incorrect. Sure. Not all of it, but 90% of no, traumatic right. events first, are incorrect. First, re first reports are always wrong. So what, what do we hear about Boston? Oh my God, the seven of the bombs and right. the blowing it's, up the it's JFK always, Center. It's always magnified. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, and, we, and then we project. So we, we have what's called automatic thoughts. What's an automatic right. thought? The boss calls you in. Hey, I'd like, Colonel, I'd like to sit down and talk with you. Yeah. Uh-oh, what right. I do wrong? Right. I don't think I'm getting promoted. Right. You know, so he's not making me a general. I'm probably getting uh, shipped out of here. I'm going to Djibouti. You know, that's so, exactly what happened, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> See, these things do happen. So, uh, so I, I tell myself, don't project. Let's manage this. And what do I know? I'm, I'm an expert in trauma. But usually I'm not the one who's dealing with the trauma. Right, yeah. So I tell myself, just take it one step at a time. Don't forget to breathe. You know, things will sort itself out. And, let, and, and then I go into action mode. What's action mode for me? There's all these other people who are really upset and hurt. Let me help them. So right. I start doing what we refer to as psychological first aid. Lots of people upset and crying. I go over to them, I say, are you okay? What's the matter? Well, my father's there and my sister, and they're from California and I'm not from Boston. I said, listen, I'll help you. It's gonna be okay. Listen, we don't know who's hurt. And then I always say, we have to look at probabilities and possibilities. Is it possible your loved one is hurt? It is possible. Is it possible they're dead? Yes. 
Is it probable? Statistically, probably not. You know, we think about terrorism in the United States. Last year in the United States, and terrorism is a horrible thing and we're trying to combat it, but last year in the United States, 34 people died from furniture accidents. Moving a refrigerator yeah, upstairs yeah, sure, and sure. they died. Right. More people died of furniture accidents than right. terrorism. Yeah, yeah. It's not to minimize or, terrorism. Or, or but, many other And many things. other things, right. right. I mean, 35,000 people died on the roads from drunk driving. Sure. So, you know, we have to keep things in perspective and we sometimes lose sight of what the real deal is. So I talked to people, I said, your loved one is probably gonna be fine. Take a deep breath. This is Boston. There's great, you know, communication here. And we all managed to get through it. Fast forward, uh, you know, I called my wife. I got through and I said, listen, we're all here. You know, if Austin, she had said Austin had called, he was fine. And I said, you know, we really need to like, just get the heck out of here because Terrorists will also, it's very common in Israel, they'll plant one bomb. Right, and it's the second one, the way for the first responders. Exactly. Right. Then they kill all the responders. Right. So, uh, so I'm thinking in my head, hey, this could be a problem. Yeah. Interesting enough, when, to, when bad events happen, 80% of the people don't know what to do. 80%. Sure. 10% of the people totally decompensate and actually require special attention. Psychiatric, someone has to hold them, they're mm -hmm. catatonic, they're in a state of shock. Then you have the other 10%. You have one of those 10 percenters. They're the sheepdogs. They're the ones, the shots are fired. Everyone else runs away from the right. fire. Where are they going? Where are the soldiers, right. the, the military, right. the first responders? Where they're going toward the shots. Those are the 10 percenters. And I would say, in life, I want to be a 10 percenter. I just want to like, try to do the right thing and help. And we know that resiliency is also tied into those qualities. People who are helpers, who are altruistic, whether it's in the military or being a clinical social worker, you get a sense of identity and you feel right. good about yourself. So when you're lying on your deathbed, you say to yourself, hey, it's, not, it's been a pretty good gig. <laughs> I don't want to be lying in it necessarily, yeah, right. but right. You, know, you can feel right. good about yourself. Because it's not about acquiring possessions in life that make people strong. Gee, I'm so glad I got those boots on sale. No, it's about experiences, relationships, family, right. you know, challenging yourself, being a, a warrior, getting over that last hurdle. Those qualities of resiliency will last people the entire lives. But, and when the body's gone, and, but you still have your memory, you can also you know, relish in the fact like, hey, I did these great things. And that allows you to have positive self-worth and self-esteem, yeah, right? Yeah. So, and sense of purpose is really all about that. It's like, what do we do? How do we get up in the morning? How do we go? Let's get going. You know, the um, people who die young during retirement, it's usually because they don't have what we refer to as active retirement. You're retired from the military, but you have active I retirement. Get, I got very lucky meeting Joe. He makes sure I stay active. <laughs> right, well, even if you don't want to be. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm, we're in Boston today, but I, we've been all over, right? I mean, it's crazy, and you know, we just stay, we just stay going. So it's great. Yeah. Listen, I, I think I could sit and talk to you for days easily. So, but but Marion over here, she keeps us on a schedule, and she's already given us a kind of a schedule yeah. we need to wind down. So. Um, one thing we always do, we always ask anybody, and I think running is going to be your answer, but uh, if you could do one exercise and only one exercise, what, what, what would it be? So it would be running, because running to me is is really freeing all the stress in my life. So I clear my head through right. running. And, I and, actually, do, and do you go out by yourself? Are you a solitary runner? Yeah, or do actually, you? I like to run with friends, okay. because I think for a number of reasons. Number one, it's it's New England, so I, it's... a uh, Wind chill factor, 15 below zero, but I got a guy waiting for me out there. I better get my behind yeah. off of okay, my yeah, bed and out there. And if he wasn't there, I'd probably just pull the covers over. Right. Too cold to run. Right. So I like to run with others, and then it becomes a social experience, yeah. and then you really get to know your running mates because you go on these long runs, you share everything with them. And we always say, what we talk about on the run stays yes, on the run. Yeah, nice. nice. Well, listen, Jeff, it's been great talking my, to my you. I really appreciate Tony. it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So what do you guys think? Obviously, I, I, I was pretty blown away by him. I mean, I sat there and talked to him, as you saw, for quite some time, and I think I could have talked to him for quite a bit longer. So I've got my own thoughts, but I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say about it, or him. Yeah, Del? Yeah, I, mean, I learned a lot from that, actually. I mean, I'm an ER doctor myself, so I deal with, with people who are... Who, you know, who've had recent trauma and some of the things I experienced myself are pretty traumatic doing my own job mm -hmm. so I learned an awful lot from listening to him because he's, he's a trauma specialist yeah and when you mentioned about learning you know you're in that field and learn interesting to hear him talk about he's in that field and he deals with it every day with other people but when he related to his own experience 
and yeah. how uh, his training had to come back and actually help him in an incredibly difficult situation as well. Yeah, and um, I really like that. I mean, it, it must be true with within your hospital that when you guys have a traumatic experience you probably have some sort of protocol or triage that you guys can are able to share that experience together because I really like what he said that you're able to overcome adversary through camaraderie and Rudyard Kipling has a, a cool quote like the it's the strength the wolf's strength is the strength of the pack and the pack is the strength of the wolf and so I think I think there's some really interesting my mom's a trauma trained therapist and it's a lot about like unprocessed trauma in your prefrontal cortex trying to it, it goes through these cycles and um I'm getting off track a little bit, but I'm just saying, like, what, what, what do you guys have in place at your hospital after you go through a traumatic experience? Because he said, don't send people home, work on it together. And I think that was interesting. In all honesty, I've never had any kind of resilience training in all of my medical really? training. So, so actually working on this podcast, I've, I've got an awful lot from it. That is, that is shocking to me. It's, yeah, it's terrifying. And I, just the way he said he's AAA, the action alleviates anxiety. You know, yeah. that's, that's a really good tool to be able to use. Mm -hmm. But we, we were talking off camera and it wasn't about this podcast but I'll tie it back in and you were talking about why you got in into doctoring into medicine and it was because of poor treatment you, you received mm. from a doctor who had no empathy for you mm. so it would seem to me that if you had this training or doctors had the training that they may be more empathetic uh, because it, you can only take in so much, right? Mm -hmm. Before yeah. Yeah. you've got to either block off or you start to, to, to bleed out yourself, if you will, right? Yeah. I mean, I would think you would need some level of, of, of the training that, he, that he's doing to yeah. help you. Because again, you, I'd imagine many doctors would be in a PTSD state because of the things they see daily. Not only, not only in trauma, cancer wards, you know, uh, babies in the NICUs. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, uh, there's a lot of sadness to go around, right? Yeah, yeah. And he says right at the beginning that, that people just need a bit of support and understanding. It's really quite simple, isn't it? He's just incredibly humble and incredibly kind. Mm -hmm. um, and he has, you know, I think he's, he talks about his own trauma in yep. there, like two part trauma, his own diagnosis with the cancer. So he's been through that. And of course, the trauma when he was running the Boston Marathon. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a huge event globally. I think yeah. everybody was shocked that he and his own son were running. And I think, you know, when you were faced with that that level of trauma yourself yeah, and he couldn't he didn't How know where he back? didn't know where his son was yeah he well he said he was a mile from the finish line but he knew his son was done or in ahead of him so he didn't know but then he had to so there was a moment where he was just a runner and a father and all that and then he had to transition and become a professional mm. and start helping others you know and he had to be able to make that that clear quick well, move yeah. Well, one thing that he mentioned that I just wanted to bring up because uh, not everyone listening or watching is going to have the opportunity to go and get advanced training like he has. Mm -hmm. He mentioned the book, The Four Agreements, and uh, how powerful those four agreements are. And that's something uh, in the coaching that I do, I recommend to every person I talk to that that book is so powerful. Uh, be impeccable with your word. Don't yeah. take things personally. Don't yeah. make assumptions and always do your best. And I thought it was really great that he threw that out there. And it really resonated with me because it's something that I've read again and again. And um, in terms of people in their day-to-day -day life and the ability to take something they can read quickly and apply immediately, um, I would second that endorsement. It's a phenomenal book. Yeah, yeah, he referenced it. I, yeah, I don't know if he even said the book, so now it's good that you guys have that name. But um, the thing I think is interesting, because all of you guys, he says, in, in, a, in a traumatic or in a crisis situation, right, you have 90% of the people who are fleeing away, right, and who don't, you know, you either react or respond, and like, and certainly from a medical perspective, if you don't know the protocols for triage, it's, you're almost in the way, and from a military perspective, and Johnny, from all the races that you've run, when all these crazy things come up, you guys really represent, you know, the 10% that, as he said, are going towards the bullets, and I think um, Mark Devine calls that sheepdog strong, you know, that's like the people that have the heart and the courage and the will that when the times get tough that's when they their skills power up and they go forward to help people and uh, it's really like that really is a nod to all the professions that you guys are in I think. well and, and just the and, idea and about what he does yeah the idea about leaning into adversity right and that's something that we talk to so many people and we see so many of them talk about being willing to lean in rather than run away from. So, but speaking mm -hmm. of running away from, we're probably gonna wrap this up. That was a great long interview. Uh, we wanted to stick with that one because it was so amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we should tell everyone else, if you wanna learn more about this uh, podcast or any others, go to SpartanUpPodcast.com and you'll uh, find out everything you're looking for. For show notes, video, and audio of this episode, visit SpartanUpPodcast.com slash 086.
Thank you for listening to another epic story of success. Follow us on Twitter at Spartan Up Pod. The Spartan Up Podcast is brought to you by Spartan. To find a race near you, visit Spartan.com. Thank <laughs> you.